We, someone put you in touch with me on Twitter because, um, like I said, I had Scott yeah. on. I like Scott. Yeah. I think he's interesting. I do too, yeah. And the timing was such that we had him booked. He turned up and a war had just broken out and he's an anti-war guy. And I was like, well, look, I, I don't feel like I can, I, yeah. I can miss this opportunity to talk to you. So we, you know, we had the conversation. Unfortunately, his uh, knowledge and recall of history – it's way beyond mine because yeah. he's an anti-war guy. He's yeah, studied yeah, every yeah, part yeah, sure. of it. I haven't. Yeah. I have to go with my vague assumptions of, okay, well, you know, Russia's authoritarian. You know, mm -hmm. Putin likes to put bullets in the back of people's heads and you know, assassinate people in the UK. Yeah. He seems to invade in a sovereign country. That to me looks pretty bad. Bad guy. Yeah, yeah bad guy. Uh, a bunch of people are being displaced. It's a humanitarian disaster. People sure. are dying. I feel pretty comfortable with those statements. Yes. Uh, Maybe tweeting some things out saying, yeah, no, no, why are people simping for Putin? He's a fucking dictator, blah, blah, blah. Yes. And then the reactions come in. No, this is NATO expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is provocation. I, I didn't feel that we were at the point where. Yeah, Ukraine, by the way, is not in NATO. I, think. I know, I know. <laughs> yes, I know, but I always but, like but, to point that out to people who are saying that. Well, yeah, but yeah, they, they yeah. were saying they wanted to join, yada, yada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've been wanting to join since 1991. Yeah. It's a long time ago, yeah. But what I'm saying is there are the people saying it is provocation, and then there's uh, there's people talking about Nazi battalions, which mm -hmm. seem to be a, an issue, but a small it, issue. It, it, it is real, yeah. It is real. Sure, for sure. And yeah. then corruption in Ukraine. and it's Also like, real, yeah. Yeah, so all this stuff was coming up, but I was like, hmm, I'm pretty sure there's Nazis in every country in the world. I mean, the head of the Wagner, the Wagner group, uh, the Russian, yeah. it's called Wagner for what reason? Because of Richard Wagner, the anti-Semitic uh, uh, composer. Uh, he, the, the guy, one of the guys that started has a SS tattoo on his neck. Right, okay. And he's Russian and they're serving, um, not serving the people of Eastern Congo right now, for instance, one of many places, Syria, et cetera. So yeah, it's a, th it's a thing that exists a lot of places. Yeah. But, the, but there's also, cor there's clear corruption in Russia. I mean, it, uh, P Putin's entire base was built on corruption yes. and, and rewarding the oligarchs for yeah. you know, yada yada. It's a kleptocracy so, for sure. Yeah, yeah, so I'm like, okay, so these these exist in both, but there seems to be a reason. The group of people are one way. Group, it's a culture war again. Yeah, it's absolutely the culture war. But in my mind, I still can't get my my head beyond the point that there seems to be an unnecessary invasion of a sovereign country. Yes. Yeah, whatever. Eight million people displaced. Whatever it is now complete destruction of cities, people being killed, certainly war crimes happening. How are some people not seeing that for what it is? But I spoke to Scott and in the end of it, I was like, well, I, I, I can't argue back because mm -hmm. I don't understand these topics as much as you. And then somebody tagged me in a post said, you talk to Michael. And here we are. Well, thank you, whoever that person is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, where do you begin with that? I mean, all of those things are bad things. And... Um, none of those things allow a country to invade and violate the sovereignty of a neighboring country. Um, there are treaties in place, uh, you know, the Budapest Memorandum, 1994, where Russia agreed to the, you know, abide by the sovereignty of Ukraine. Because Ukraine, after, after the fall of the, the, the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War, became, I think, the third largest nuclear power in the country because they were all based there. Keeping in, keeping in mind Chernobyl's and, and Ukraine. And that was part of the deal. If the disarmament was to, was to um, okay, we'll, we'll hand these over and you grant us our sovereignty. The NATO expansion thing has been a line that we've heard um, since NATO expansion. There was, some, you know, oh, they said not an inch to the east. I mean, none of this was codified, by the way. Here, here's the thing that's interesting about this. When you have these things, you say you won't do X, and there's large diplomacy at stake, you codify them into treaties, into agreements, et cetera. None, there's none of that, right? And as if to prove the point that NATO is necessary, the Russians invaded two countries in the region, both of which had NATO aspirations but were not members of NATO, for the very reason that was demonstrated when they were both invaded, and that's Georgia. And I was in Georgia right after that, that invasion in Gori, and um, that is Ukraine. Uh, so why are now, this is backfiring on Putin, and for the people who think NATO is such a horrible, malign influence, um, oh, it's not a defense. It is, it is a defensive thing. We can talk about Libya and stuff like that, but you know, in this region, they're not invading anyone, right? Um, you know, the Warsaw Pact, this is, NATO was created as a, as a counterweight to the Warsaw Pact. And as somebody 
said, and I can't take credit for it, the Warsaw Pact is the only uh, pact that invaded, the only invasions it did were two of its own countries. It invaded Hungary and Czechoslovakia. <laughs> and so Warsaw Pact is invading people within its own space for, for, you know, showing some sort of independence in 1956 and 68. But that said is that, you know, Finland, Sweden, I lived in Sweden, that was a debate that has been, I mean, Swedes were opposed to NATO, uh, you know, being a member of NATO. And for the first time ever since the late 40s, over 50% of respondents and polls in both Sweden and Finland wanted to join NATO. And now they're in the process of doing that. And they're negotiating with Turkey, who is trying to use this as a political uh, way, a country that shouldn't be in NATO, by the way. But, um, but yeah, I mean, th th this is a pretty obvious thing. You don't want to be invaded. And you want to join an alliance of people that will have your back. There's nothing complicated about this. Ukraine has been threatened from the very, very beginning of the Russian Federation at the end of the Cold War in 1991. Um, you know, Vladimir Zhirinovsky, a, a guy of the, the unfortunately named Liberal Democratic Party who died about a month ago, had made a career out of threatening Ukraine and saying it should be taken back into, into Mother Russia. Um, you can have these conversations and arguments about whether historically, you know, Crimea, you know, is, 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 and of course, uh, Putin talks about, you know, he's upset at Khrushchev for, for Crimea and giving it away to the Ukrainians. Okay, fine. You don't invade them, though. You have these conversations in the, with the proper channels, invading them in a way that is so destructive. And the destruction that I saw when I was in Ukraine is is a horror. I mean, it's unbelievable that this is happening in 2022 in Europe. I mean, the defense of this has shifted from a defense of Putin. I mean, they all claim that they're not sycophants of Putin, though I've met a number who actually are, um, particularly, by the way, conservatives, like, you know, Catholic um, conservatives, national conservatives, they call themselves that they love that Putin pushes back and on, you know, the trans stuff. And he made, you know, he made a comment at the beginning of the war about, you know, you in the West, you have all trans rights and all this stuff. And like all the people that you want on your side are like salivating, like, see, he's one of us. He's one of us. It's a very easy, silly thing to do. But yeah, I don't understand how at this point, I mean, they, well, look, I'll say this. The conversation has shifted to, should we supply the Ukrainians with arms? And how much? And are we risking World War III? That's the thing. You know, yeah. Ad infinitum, World War III, World War III. Um, well, we're not risking World War III. They are. <laughs> Sorry to say. You don't inv invade Ukraine. None of this happens. But I don't know how the Russians who couldn't take Kiev are going to successfully launch World War III. And with what allies? Not a lot of people that are on their side except the Syrians. Um, and they're thankful because the Russians came in and, and uh, turned a bunch of parts of Syria into parking lots. Um, a massive series of war crimes that nobody paid attention to at the time, by the way. And we didn't pay much attention to Georgia either. And there's been this, I mean, w where does Putin get this idea? Nobody stops him. And nobody stops him. And I think he, he underestimated the Ukrainian response and the European response and the American response too. Um, particularly Poland, you know, which had been kind of squishy on how they treated, treated Moscow. Uh, not now. I mean, it's, it, the Poles are, you know, ready to to fight. Uh, and, you know, I, the number of people who have joined the army has increased by like 20, 30 percent. I mean, they're on, they're on war footing, uh, really war footing in, in, in Poland. When, you know? when were you last there? So I was there, I think probably f three weeks in, four weeks in, something like that. Okay. Yeah, refugees were still streaming out. I mean, now they're going back. And, and what parts did you travel to? So we were in, started in Poland uh -huh. and around the border. And then we were in Lviv, and then north of Lviv. And then we were supposed to go to, um, I had a crew. Um, we were supposed to go to a um, uh, training facility, um, waking up in the next morning to go to this training facility. And the air raid siren we heard the previous night uh, was because the facility had been hit. And Pretty 35 sure. people, um, some of whom were with the unit that we were with the previous, previous day, which is an international unit. Um, there were some Brits and Americans, but there were a lot of Poles, you know, uh, Balkan, uh, not Balkan, um, Baltic people, people who, you know, have a, a long history of, of, uh, Russian aggression. And so they, it's the kind of, they're going there to fight. And that's a really interesting thing. Poles are there to fight. Estonians are there to fight. I mean, the, the second largest for the first I think, month of the war 
after the U.S., supplier of weapons, money, and materiel to Ukraine was Estonia. That's incredible because that's a country at risk because it's four million or something like that. But also geographically, it has it shares a border with Russia, yeah. and it also has a very large Russian-speaking minority, uh, which is usually what happens. You know, in 1939, the Germans invaded Poland with the excuse of, you know, Danzig, you know, Gdansk, you know, which they, this is German. I mean, there's a lot of other excuses, but ethnic Germans, Volksdeutsch, they called them. The same thing is true in Czechoslovakia. You know, those are those ethnic Germans there. The, the Russians do that too, right? I mean, this is like we have, there are people who speak Russian. Well, yeah, why are there people who speak Russian in Ukraine? <laughs> because when you occupy Ukraine, sometimes people go and live there and, you know, remain there and keep their language and they should be treated fairly. And, and there wasn't a huge bit of evidence that they were being treated horribly unfairly either. It's like there was no genocide of people. I mean, the war has been going on in the, in the Donbass region since 2014. But yeah, I mean, it, it's, as far as morally, I don't think that there's a convincing argument that um, what the Russians have done is defensible in any way. In any way. I mean, I, I find it completely impossible. Well, you should respect their sovereignty. Well, they're a sovereign com- country. If they want to join NATO, it's their fucking business, right? How, why does a big bully neighbor get to, to uh, tell them what, they, what, what they're allowed to do? Uh, they shouldn't, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's madness to say. And then, of course, when they make noises, they want that. And it's usually, I mean, the 2014 revolution was, it was in, they were turning away from Europe and people were very upset about that because a promise was broken that they would be a more European-facing country and not a Russian-facing country. It's, it's an absolute losing proposition with a sclerotic economy and, a, you know, what was then a kind of semi-authoritarian country, which is now a, a full-on dictatorship. At the, at, the, at the moment. And don't let anyone tell you differently. It's a dictatorship. What, what was the scale of the, the destruction you actually saw? I, I, I didn't know. So f- for me, uh, we were trying to go places that made it difficult. And I am not a journalist that likes to go um, take pictures in front of burned out tanks. What we were doing was we were doing a story on foreign fighters. Okay. And the foreign fighters were coming in through Poland and the points with where they were being dispersed was from Lviv. And, you know, I have wanted to go back, um, particularly to, to Kiev, which is now um, liberated and uh, not quite back to the way it was, but uh, there's a lot of people there and it's, there's traffic jams. And I've been talking to people there that I, that I know that's getting, getting closer to, to what it looked like prior to the war. But as far as uh, the destruction, I mean, the destruction that I saw was being at the train station, shooting at the train station, by the way, and being stopped by... Um, what we presume were members of the secret police uh, that gave us a really, really hard time, really hard time. Uh, and they said, you know, why were you in Crimea? You were, you were filming in Crimea. It's like, no, we weren't filming in Crimea. And I think they saw that it was vice and that vice had done something, but they were like, we're going to detain you kind of thing. And it was a pretty dodgy, mo- like there was a, we had a Ukrainian guy there that was like arguing on our behalf, but you know, it's, it, it was a very tense atmosphere. Of course, there's, there's security checkpoints everywhere. But that was, I mean, th- the scale of the destruction you see in a human way of a train station full of women and children, no men. There's some men saying goodbye. And there's old men too. But it's just people trying to pack on trains to get out that night. And there are people that were left there. And you go back the next night and it's just, it's just the massive humanity. And it's really, really the most depressing thing I've ever seen. Children crying, people, I mean, we shot this guy who was, you know, was inconsolable with his, you know, I mean, literally in, you know, which seems like a Hollywood thing of like touching the glass of the train uh, for his little daughter. And they were going to Denmark and he was staying uh, to join the military because he was uh, forbidden from leaving. 18 to 60, you can't yeah, leave. Yeah, you can't leave, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that, seeing that scale and then being on the border too and, and, and seeing people try to get out was horrible, you know? Um and we went to a few soldiers' funerals in kind of places that were, we were the only one media there because it was far off and friends of friends knew people a couple hours, I think, north of, of um, Lviv and somebody that was killed in Luhansk and the entire town came out and it was, it was a real horror to see. 